Christ is risen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. I just felt like we ought to stand on these, right? We've kind of gotten out of the habit. We're going to work on getting back to some of those ways that we have always worshipped together. Happy Easter. It's so good to see everyone. Um, we had some breakfast available um, between the two services, 
and there is still some left, so if you want to have a few words of fellowship and chit-chat and Easter greetings with one another, there is still going to be um, some food and drink out there, so please share it now. Um, and next week, after service, um, we are going to be celebrating Melody's 21 years of service as our secretary here at Gloria Day. So she's over there. <laughs> dreading my announcement and wishing I will be quiet very, very soon. Um, but we are going to gather after worship next week for um, special breakfast and to make sure that we all get to thank Melody for all the ways she's um, served us and, and the Lord for sure. So um, please remember that. <laughs> and they'll be staying around. We're not saying goodbye. We're just giving her a good rest, right? And then Jay has to keep her busy or something. Okay. Um, so, a couple things. The mowing schedule is out on the table. If anybody wants to get a head start and signing up for that, um, I don't know how soon we're going to need to mow, but hopefully sooner than it looks like right now. Um, so the mowing schedule is out there, and also some um, early registration forms for day camp. And there's more information about that in the bulletin, so please check that out. I invite you then to um, stand as you are able and sing the hymn of praise. Can you look at 
beside the tube for me? Oh no, that's a little dirty. Um, Kai looked like he was willing. Are you willing? No! Me! Okay, Joy. Alright. You're always game. Alright, what's in there? Anything? Anybody? Just a bed. Is there is there clothes on the bed? No. Oh, just a cloth? Okay. Is it really dark in there? There's a light. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, you have done an excellent job describing this for everybody. You're sure there's nobody in there? No? Okay. That's good news. That's really good news. When the women came to the tomb on Easter Sunday, they expected to find someone in there, right? They expected to find Jesus. Because he had died on the cross, they saw him die. He had been laid in the tomb, and they came to bring his spices and to visit him and to kind of pay their pay their respects to Jesus. Okay. So they came and the stone was rolled away and the tomb was open and what was in there? Nothing, right? Yeah. So Jesus was risen. And that was really surprising, but really good news. And they were very excited. They ran back to tell all of Jesus' friends. And they weren't sure because it sounded a little silly. And then, and then, Peter thought, nope, i got to check this one out for myself. So he didn't come up here as fast, uh, this carefully and quietly as he liked as you did. But he ran very, very fast to the tomb, almost fell over, tripped over himself, and looked inside, and he saw that it was empty. Yes. And that Jesus was risen. So we all get to go out today and tell everybody what we found in there. Nothing. Right? But what we really find in there is hope and new life because Jesus is risen. Okay. Thanks for coming up and checking that out. The first lesson is from the 65th chapters of Isaiah. New heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For, all the, for like the days of the tree shall be days of my people, and my chosen shall be long and enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Christ raised from the dead the first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 26. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead shall also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, for each in his own order. 
Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. Then he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find Jesus' body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then the women remembered Jesus' words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to the apostles an idle tale, and they did not believe the women. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Christ is risen. risen Alleluia. We are Easter people. Every Sunday in our worship and praise, we gather to proclaim Christ is risen. And every Sunday we are sent out in love and in service to our neighbor and proclaim that Christ is risen. We're Easter people. And so we hear this question why do you seek the living among the dead? And we nod with familiarity. Well, of course we aren't seeking the living among the dead. Not us. We come today of all days expecting that tomb to be empty. In fact, it's more than expecting, but rather I think we count on it being empty. Or do we? Mary Magdalene Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women who had been there when Jesus was crucified, came that morning of the first Easter expecting to find Jesus' dead body in the tomb. And with good reason, really, because on Friday they'd stood near the cross and they watched him die. They had seen him laid in the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had so compassionately provided. And they had watched them roll that stone in front of the entrance to seal the tomb until they could return after the Sabbath to care for Jesus' body. It had been two days. It was the beginning of the third day now, but it had, been done, had to be done. This chore, this obligation, this act of honoring the dead. 
And so even though the Sabbath had needed to be faithfully observed at sundown on a Friday, they came at early dawn on Sunday. At the next possible free moment that they had, the women kept their commitment. Even though they expected that it wouldn't change a thing. Even though Jesus was dead and several days had passed, they still went. They went to the tomb seeking the dead body. And they expected to find their dead Jesus in the place where death belongs, in a tomb. But what did they find instead? The stone that had sealed the tomb had been moved, and inside, no body of Jesus. And as if that wasn't startling enough, suddenly there's a dazzling duo of men appearing before them. The women are terrified. They bow their heads, perhaps to avoid the blinding light, and the two men speak. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And placing ourselves in the women's shoes, we can see how absolutely unhelpful all of those questions and statements are. First of all, they had clearly come, spices in hand, to a tomb seeking the dead, not the living. And second, well, obviously they can see Jesus isn't there, but where is he? And finally, risen? What is that supposed to mean? He was dead. They watched him die. They watched how he was laid inside the tomb. Risen? That's just not how it works. Well, thankfully, the dazzling men don't stop there with their somewhat sarcastic question. They help the frightened women a bit more. And they're still a matter of fact, but... We can imagine perhaps they say the rest a little more gently. Remember? Remember he told you when he was with you in Galilee. The Son of Man will be taken into the hands of sinners, be crucified and raised on the third day. And Luke tells us that the women did remember. Yes, the remembering in the empty tomb and even those two sort of sarcastic, glowing messengers, well, it all comes together. Luke doesn't describe any more detail for us, but you can just see how that recognition might dawn across the women's faces, all of them starting to smile and grin and nod at one another. Well, yes, yes, he did tell us. Well, of course he's not here. He is risen, yes, living, not dead. Now the women, with their old expectations rolled away with the stone, are now filled with expectation of new life and resurrection. And they return to the 11 disciples to tell them. Well, the disciples are waiting. They're waiting for the women and they're expecting to hear a story. That when the women return, they will tell them about how the body had looked and perhaps how it smelled and if they had any trouble with that large stone. And then there would likely be some tears. There would be stories about Jesus and grieving over their lost hopes. The disciples were seeking the dead. Of course they were. They saw Jesus arrested. They heard the crowd before Pilate shouting, crucify him, crucify him. He saw him hanging on the cross. He was laid in the tomb, and dead is dead. But what is this that they're hearing from the women? The women return from their unenviable but necessary errand, and they're telling an idle tale. A tale about a stone already moved, a tomb that was empty, men dressed in dazzling white that claim that Jesus is living, is risen. And the women remembered Jesus' words of how he would die and rise again. Not that they had ever really understood what he meant until now. But dead is dead, and that is how things work. It's an idle tale. It's crazy talk. It's nonsense. But though it sounds like nonsense, Peter goes. 
Uh, do you think he remembered any better than the rest did? Did Jesus' words come back to him suddenly as they did at the tomb for the women? Or was it something else that sent Peter running? Perhaps the memory of the courtyard and the three crows of the rooster that he had heard across the night air. I doubt he was jogging at a slow pace. No, more like a full-out sprint. And maybe he didn't stoop to look in the tomb so much as he stumbles from trying to halt his own forward inertia. He falls to the ground, his chest heaving. He's breathless. He's wiping the sweat out of his eyes. And what he sees through the opening to the tomb leaves him now breathless with amazement instead. Was the dazzling duo still hanging around? Was the risen Jesus in the tomb? We do not know, but Luke says that Peter was amazed. And after all that had taken place, the trial, the arrest, the crucifixion, this empty tomb is amazing enough on its own. We come from the same place as the women and the disciples. We come from a world that experiences death. And there are bodies dying on crosses and being laid in tombs all around us. Ukraine war-torn and under siege. Gun violence, reports of possibly a new COVID variant, hatred, division, cancer, depression, racism, sexism, hunger, homelessness, grief, lost hopes, and dashed dreams. Yes, you and I, we come to Easter worship just as the women and the disciples approached the tomb. And perhaps today we feel we have a job to do, a duty, a task. It is Easter, and being here, well, that's just what is done. And we like the lilies, and the trumpets are fun, and, but none of it really has any power to change any of the circumstances we're facing. Perhaps we are listening to all of this and a small part of us or maybe even a big part of us is saying to ourselves, this is nonsense, this is crazy talk, it is an idle tale, dead is dead. But maybe, maybe like Peter, we have come to take a peek just in case there is something amazing going on. Whatever you've come for, whatever crosses you are carrying or tombs you have lain in, I hope and I pray that while you are here, you get to remember what you forgot that you already knew. You will remember the things that you forgot that you have heard Jesus say about dying and rising again. You will remember all the winters that have turned into spring. You'll remember all the light that shines in the darkness. You'll remember kind words and friendly gestures. You'll remember all the small and not so small ways that you have been able to witness life come forth out of death. And then here, here, in the presence of an empty tomb, here where people insist on singing songs and praying prayers and shouting alleluias, what you remember might join together with what you're seeing and hearing. And yes, maybe then you too can join in the shouting and the tale telling and the singing for yourselves. Whatever you came today expecting to see, I hope today your expectations are somehow turned a little upside down because that is experiencing Easter. Easter isn't about our expectations. I mean, if we walked in here to nothing but an empty building, oh wait, that happened for two years, Christ would still be risen. Jesus doesn't need the trumpets or the lilies. Christ the Lord is risen today is not some magical set of words that just suddenly makes the resurrection possible. All those things are not Easter. The risen Christ is Easter. 
The rest is just trappings. Now, don't get me wrong. I love all of it. And it helps us to celebrate with meaning this crazy and idle tale. But we don't do any of this to put an exclamation point on the resurrection. Whatever we expected in a world that deals in death and crosses and bodies and tombs, Christ's tomb still stands empty. Christ is alive. He is risen. And he isn't risen just today. He's risen always and forever each day. And we are still sent to tell that idle tale. Because Jesus lives, so do you. So do I. We might have come looking for a dead body. And there wasn't one. Not then. Not now. So remember again what you forgot that you already knew. And go now. Tell the others. Christ is risen. risen Alleluia. Surprising God, you offer endless ways for us to delight in your grace. 
give this community of faith a sense of joy and wonder in exploring new avenues of faith formation, worship, and discipleship. Lord, in your mercy. Resurrected God, you make us alive in Christ. Thank you for blessing us with faithful witnesses who now rest in you. Lord, in your mercy. We offer to you these petitions and those we carry in our hearts, trusting in your abundant and ever-present mercy. Amen.
that God is good and know this is the body of Christ given for you. Then, in the same manner, go back the seal on the wine or the juice as you drink, as you taste and see and know that God is good. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 